Good morning. I guess this is for me. I don't need this right now. My name is Ben, and I'm one of the three uh, full-time staff members here, and um, I don't get to preach very much, so when I do, uh, I really enjoy it. Um, but uh, if you've noticed, uh, over the last few weeks, we've been doing something a little bit different for Lent. Uh, usually for Lent, you give something up, something you really like, or maybe you need to purge something from your life for a while, like watching the Timberwolves lose. Um, and I know some of you are saying, Ben, you're a Lakers fan, and they're terrible too. The problem is the Lakers beat the Timberwolves on Wednesday. So there's that. This year, we're not doing something uh, that crazy. We're gearing Lent toward Easter. Big bright idea, right? Not really. Uh, Lent is supposed to prepare you for Easter. It's supposed to prepare you mentally. It's supposed to prepare you spiritually for Easter. And so we've been introducing things to give up that might be in the way of you inviting others to Easter at the Ralph. The first week we talked about giving up our apathy. It's not okay not to care. It's not okay not to care that thousands of people may not go anywhere on Easter Sunday, though they may like to, simply because nobody cared enough to ask them, to invite them. Apathy. It's not okay not to care that thousands of people in Thief River Falls do not know Jesus just yet. That was week one. Second week, we talked about giving up the barriers that we put between us and others. The big question was simply, what are you more passionate about than Jesus? What do you actually talk about um, with your friends, family, and coworkers that's more important than, than Jesus? Is Jesus as important of a conversation as the one you're willing to lose friends over on Facebook? Giving up barriers for Lent. That was week two. And then third week, we are talking about comfort, giving up our personal comfort in order to in invest relationally in the lives of others, giving up our right to be comfortable. Well, like I said, I don't preach very much. Um, one of the last times I did, I made a record um, that may never be broken in all of Epiphany Station's future. I preached for 47 minutes. <laughs> which Maddie loves because he held the previous 14 records. <laughs> so it takes me a little bit longer to prep for, for teaching. I, it's not what I normally do. And, um, and I've learned that if I go off the cuff too much that I end up preaching for 47 minutes. So if you see me staring at the iPad a lot today, it's because I respect that you'd like to have lunch before too. Um, and so I'm going to try to stick to my notes here. But I'll tell you, when I was prepping for this message this week, is as if God said to me, oh, you're preaching on comfort. You will have none of it. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of a tough week. Uh, while writing this message, I just, I just had all sorts of inner turmoil. You know, the kind that leads to the throw-ups. Um, and that's not normal for me. I feel like I can handle a lot of things at a time, but... Not this week. I wasn't finding comfort in my situation. I wasn't finding comfort in anything. And it is as if God was telling me, Ben, if you are going to find any comfort this week, you're going to have to find it in me. That was the backdrop to writing this message. And I'll just cue you in about what we're going to talk about concerning comfort today. We're going to talk about what it isn't. We're going to talk about what it is. But mostly I want to challenge you guys to not let worldly, temporary comfort rob you of the comfort that comes from God, the comfort that lasts. So what is comfort? According to the dictionary, it's a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint. Now, I'm 36. I'm just old enough to have experienced um, the extreme amount of uh, excitement there, there was in the early 80s when waterbeds were really popular. <laughs> and 
the funny thing about them is when they came out, they were just all the, all the rave. I mean, everybody wanted one. And within a month or two, you saw a lot of waterbeds for sale used. <laughs> Some of you know why. Uh, on, on Craigslist or, or, or in the paper. And the reason was, when you tried out a waterbed, it felt great. I mean, who doesn't lay on a waterbed compared to all the other firm mattresses? Maybe when you're checking out, trying to buy a new bed, you lay in a waterbed. Who doesn't just go, ah. But the trouble is people would sleep on those waterbeds for a night. They would sleep on them for a week. And then they started to hate them. And then they sold them. Now, how could something you loved so much a few days ago turn into something that you hated and needed to sell and lose money on? I think the reason is because the waterbed, and I'll say that they're better now, but back then, they weren't that great. They should have been called the passive-aggressive bed <laughs> because they felt good, but they never really supported you. That was a joke. Thanks, Manny. In the long run, temporary comfort, it, it just lets you down. So I've got four points about comfort to make. And the first one in your program, is that what we call them? We're a church plant. We've got to call everything different, different names. In your program, you'll notice there are a few blanks there and a uh, little bit of space for notes. But the first point is that some comfort fades. Some comfort fades. If you turn your TV on and try to watch the show that you want to watch, uh, in between watching your favorite show, you will find all sorts of advertisements that basically try to get you to buy things to make your life easier. It seems to be the goal of life for many of us. It's why we have auto starts on our cars. It's why we have uh, a thriving fast food market. <laughs> it's why I live next to Earl's Market, in fact. Um, but how does that fit into the way that Jesus calls us to live? And does it? Because we know that comfort isn't evil. We know that it's not God's will that we live in absolute pain and suffering and, and seek it out. In fact, that is viewed as unhealthy. It's okay to relax. It's okay to not search out pain. But there's a part of us when we talk about comfort that feels guilty about it. Why is that? I think it's simply because we confuse temporary comfort with lasting comfort that God provides. If we look at 1 John 2, verse 17, it says, And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. True comfort and the comfort that we think we want sometimes confuse us. Like this last week for me, I knew I could find lasting comfort in God. But I'll be honest, I didn't want that right away. That's not what I wanted on Wednesday. I wanted resolve. I wanted answers. I wanted immediate comfort. The truth is temporary comfort eases temporary pain, but it solves nothing. Some comfort fades. Point two is that some comfort lasts. Some comfort lasts. Now, the difference between comfort directly from God and the comfort we find in a box of donuts is how long it lasts, isn't it? Now, God is totally okay with donuts, but he also wants to give us the best that he's got. That's lasting comfort. God's comfort is lasting simply because it's a glimpse of eternity, and it comes from him. It's not a glimpse of earth. And the bigger thing about comfort is that God doesn't just give it to us just for us. He wants to introduce this kind of comfort to other people in the church and other people where we live. And when a church pursues that kind of lasting comfort, it does well. It starts a great thing in motion. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in, our, in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God's given us. Comfort lasts as long as the source. Donuts. How long does a box of donuts last? In our office, it depends whose room they're in. Comfort from God? 
Well, how long has God been around? Long time, forever. Some comfort lasts. Point three is that some comfort costs. Some comfort costs. Now, it will be unfair and unloving to skip this point because God's comfort is lasting, but it comes with a cost because when we completely cling to him, we start to identify with him, and when we identify with him, we start to experience some of the things that Jesus experienced on earth. We start to experience pain. We start to experience trials. And God knows that the only way we can accomplish what he told us to do is to completely cling to him for our comfort. Now, Jesus loves us the same way he loved his disciples. So when he sends us out, he tells it just like it is. Let's take a look at the way he sent out the, uh, they sent out the disciples in Matthew 10. He says, But don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed, and all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What's the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? Not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And here's the tough part. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Jesus tells them this harsh reality because if the disciples find their comfort in anything but God, they will completely fail at what he's called them to do. As they identify with Christ and as they start to live like him, they're going to suffer a lot of the same challenges, and so will we. And Because God loves us, he tells us the truth about that, that some comfort costs. As we identify and live with Christ, we're going to have earthly pain, we're going to have trials, but through those things, we grow deeper with God and we start to not only find a comfort that lasts, but a comfort that solidifies in him. Point four, some comfort saves. Some comfort saves. How? Well, when we follow God, we seek out our comfort in him, amazing things are able to happen because we're completely freed up from all the things that we want. We're completely freed up from all the things that we're worried about and we're able to just focus on what God wants for us. In fact, to share the gospel with our words and to share the gospel with people with our life we have to be able to put ourselves to the side and put others first. That's only possible through God. And when the comfort we're seeking out is not about us, but it's about finding our worth in Christ, we are freed to follow him. Philippians 2 says, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Is that a comfortable way to live? To put others before yourselves? Not really. In fact, it's impossible to do if your identity isn't in Christ. When your comfort comes from God, you're no longer afraid to do what he wants you to do. You'll stand up for him because your comfort doesn't come from the world's affirmation. You'll stand up for others because your comfort comes from God, not the loud crowd majority. You might even invite people to a gas station for church. You might invite them to the Ralph for Easter. When we seek our comfort in God alone, it frees us to live in a way where people see Jesus clearly. Is God asking you to invite someone to church next week? And are you afraid? If you're feeling afraid, it's a simple answer. Stop it. Stop it. Focus on your comfort with God and everything else makes sense. When we find our comfort in Him, other people get to see it too. 
and they're able to find it. Continual comfort that saves. Some comfort saves. Well, I've been in Thief River Falls for 11 years now. Um, And I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be here for 11 years. But sometimes a smoking hot Norwegian girl with a last name of Hicks draws you in. (laughs) And you, you, hey. (laughs) How you doing? So... That was not my initial plan to be here for 11 years, although my wife grew up here. We met in Memphis at school, and so when the school year was over, we came back here. Um, Kevin Brown uh, had told Tasha's family that I could stay in his basement while we uh, did our uh, premarital counseling, and, and eventually we got married. And my plan was, after staying in Kevin's basement for a few months, um, uh, we would get married and we would move to California, right? Right? because that's where I was going, that's where I'm from. And um, that didn't really happen. Um, In fact, what happened next was, um, at that time, the house prices just skyrocketed at home, and I had no way to really figure how to to make a living there. So I just thought, well, let's buy a house here. We'll stick around for a couple of years. It needs some work. I'll put some work into the house. We'll maybe make a few bucks, and then we'll we'll go to California. Um, We'll fix it up and we'll get out of here. Um, That didn't really work out either because I started to love this town. Um, But as everybody knows, I'm from California, and I always will be from California. I I was there till I was 24. Um, And I got to say, over the last year or two, God has just been breaking my heart for that area again. Um, And partially because when I was there as a a young man in my early 20s and, and late teens, I quite honestly feel like I was part of the problem, kind of playing Christianese living and, and goofing off, not really doing anything for God, just goofing around, being selfish. <laughs> yeah. So I've longed, especially after experiencing Epiphany Station and the changes it's made in my life, I've longed for an opportunity to be able to bring that kind of experience there. I've seen how it's changed my life. I've seen how it's changed so many of yours. And quite honestly, I've just hoped and prayed that someday I would get to be part of the solution where I grew up rather than part of the problem. So this last November, to cut to the chase, I I got a phone call from a friend whose sister-in-law worked for a a, a church and they were looking for a worship leader. Um, Over the last few months, we've been talking and uh, they offered me a job a few weeks ago and I accepted it. Um... So I will be here through mid-May. Um, and uh, the reason I, I bring this up is because it's scary. As much sense as it makes to me, and to a lot of you, you understand, well, of course he wants to go home. Um, But the reason I'm scared to death about this whole opportunity, as good as it is, is because I love this church. But the bigger reason than that is that I'm comfortable here. (laughs) This my whole job is like custom made for me. I was here from when there were six or seven people in Kevin's living room. It's hard to find that kind of opportunity. And I know some of you are saying, "What are you scared for?" I mean, yeah, California looks really uncomfortable and terrible. (laughs) <laughs> Let me just uh, walk you through a couple of things that are convenient and comfortable for me living in Thief River Falls. Uh, we just remodeled our house this last summer. It's gorgeous. It's perfect. It's for sale. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> I've got a man cave at my house. I've got a jukebox and a pool table, maybe for sale. Um, Kevin's been, Kevin Brown, one of the overseers, has, he's been taking me to lunch, helping me process through this whole experience, and he always pays for lunch. Um, Maddie and Jeff de- dearly want me to stay. Um, they've been bribing me with root beer. Um, <laughs> yeah. The office, you know, the house next door, I live next to Earl's. It's like three blocks away. Uh, it's so convenient. Um, my wife, 
She grew up here. Her family's here. The worship team that led today, they're awesome. I mean, I only have to lead two or three times a month. Comfort. The cost of living here is cheap. Comfort. My wife grew up here. Comfort. I've got a great team of musicians and techs, most of which are my best friends. Comfort. And I'll just say that some of the logistical details about California for me right now are not making a whole lot of sense. The trouble is, a couple weeks ago when I made this decision, they all did. And since then, some of those things have kind of fallen apart. It's as if God was saying, you've been telling people I'm calling you there. Now, do you really trust me? (laughs) Because the worst part of some of this, or the hardest part, is some of my closer friends are having trouble with this too, and it's hard to understand. It's hard to explain something like this. Why would you want to move? You know, all of those things, all of those things, that was why this week I had something called the throw-ups. Um, I was just not doing well <laughs> midweek, and God has just been saying repeatedly, yeah, 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 details, details. Do you trust me? Now, Natasha and I, we know that God's calling us there. And like anybody else, we, we tried to make this decision uh, as effectively as we could. We made a pros and cons list on Google Documents, and I shared it with her. And um, we haven't looked at it for quite a few weeks now because I think the last time I looked at it, I'm looking down the list of these things and I'm realizing that everything I was worried about had to do with comfort or fear or money or my house. And I just had this moment where I kind of yelled out, I do not want to make my decisions to follow God this way. You know, I don't want to teach that to my kids. That's not how I want to follow God. And even bigger than that, Epiphany Station does not exist in the way it does because we have made decisions in this church based on our preferences, based on what's safe, based on what's the most logical, based on what's made the most sense to our peers and the other churches in town, based on what makes the most sense financially. I know some of you are going, yeah, that's for sure. But we just haven't. We've just passionately followed God. And that you've seen how some of the details have miraculously just worked out over the years. Fear, money, comfort, they are so misleading. And the fact is that many of you may not have found Christ if this church and others preferred comfort over following God. When we put our our trust and we make all of our decisions based on, on comfort, based on fear, based on the things we're worried about, we're completely misled. Those things do not put Christ in the number one spot. It's far from it. Is comfort a bad thing? No. Unless it gets in the way of following Jesus. God wants us to cling to him and him alone. And so this next Sunday, you know, we're putting in all this work. We're renting the Ralph. It, it, it costs money too. But we're not doing all that because we want to throw a, a rock show with bouncy houses. We're offering hope to people. We're offering them hope. We're inviting them to this amazing journey with us. And frankly, this journey is awesome because what we're celebrating on Easter is that Jesus has the power and the authority to offer it. It's not an empty promise. We're calling them to a deep and tough thing. But that's what we're celebrating next week, and and, and that's why we've been so adamant these last three three weeks about trying to remove feelings of apathy for those in our community, the friends and family we have around us, trying to remove the barriers that unnecessarily are there between us and inviting people to church. And it's not that church is the main point, but it's a starting point, isn't it? And people see Jesus and they see the value of him when they see us together celebrating him the way we do. Choosing him over comfort. That's what we're inviting you to. I want to do a little experiment. And I'm going to say something, and then you just get to answer me in your own head. And I want you to take note of what comes up. And then I want you to take note of what comes up after that. I'm going to say something now, and just listen, and just think of the first thing that pops in your mind. 
Invite your friend to Easter. Who just came to mind? Because I imagine right now you're going through a list of things that would disqualify you from having to invite them or reasons it won't work. But I want you to know that those thoughts aren't from God. That's not the God we serve. And because of that, because many of you, when I said that, had a name or two that popped in your head and immediately started to go towards fear and why you can't do that and why that wouldn't be logical, blah, blah, blah. Because of that, I want to read you some words that actually are from God. These are meant to remind you of who he is. They're meant to remind you that you do not need to settle for temporary comfort, that God has something bigger for you. So I'm going to have you listen to these few Bible verses Um, I'm going to have you just close your eyes and take a minute and soak them in and just remember who our God is. Here we go. Joshua 1.9, God says, This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Philippians 4.13 says, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Deuteronomy 31.8 Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Those are the words of God. Those are God's words, not the words that pop in your head that tell you you can't do it or why you shouldn't or why it doesn't make sense. I don't want you guys to forget that past being people that that follow Jesus, we, we often forget that we're actually God's children too and that we really have nothing to fear. The truth is that some comfort is there and is accessible, but it's a type of comfort that fades. But some comfort, if we pursue it, saves. Our prayer for you um, as, as leaders, as we gear up this week toward Easter, is that you guys will choose to find that saving comfort in God and that you won't settle for temporary comfort, but you will choose to find that comfort in God. And as we celebrate that on Easter, others will be able to see it. Amen? Let me pray. God, I just, I thank you first for who you are and the fact that through your son, you don't call us to do anything that he didn't do. And that through his resurrection, that God, we actually have the ability to follow through and the ability to do what you say through your power and and your love for us. But God, uh, we are just surrounded by temporary and distracting comforts that distract us from doing what you want us to do and distract us not just from doing those things, God, but from being happy, from being satisfied in you. So God, I I pray that you would draw us into a deeper understanding of comfort this week especially, God, as we invite others to, to taste and see that as we celebrate on Easter. God, we pray that you would help this church to be one that celebrates the comfort that saves and um, celebrates the fact that it's worth the cost and that it's a cost that you have paid already. But God, we pray you would help us to live it out in that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, I am so excited today. It's like I woke up and thought, today is the day to get working for Jesus. Kat, I am so excited to find someone who's ready to take action and get things done. Oh man, I am that girl. Exactly. Yeah. I've got something perfect for you, so let's get started. What are you doing? Uh, Stand up. Remember, we were going to take action. Yeah, but this is where I always sit. 
Right, but I need more than this. Oh, I know what you're getting at. Okay, Jesus, how much do you want? What? $50? Is that enough? Oh, uh, that's not what I meant. Oh, uh, all right. Well, a hundred then, you know. I mean, you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> um, okay, but, um... You might not want to cash this till next Friday, you know what I'm saying? Right. There you go. <laughs> okay, okay, Kat, really, I, I do think it's great that you want to give, but... I want you to mentor a younger woman. Ooh, yeah, right. Well, Jesus, you know, I'm not really into, like, teaching people and stuff. I mean, I'm not, I don't really get into that. Okay, um, okay, you, you know that woman at the office, Amy? Yeah. I want you to take her out to lunch. Tell her about me. Um, well, Amy is different. I mean, like, really different, you know? I know, but she needs to know about me. Mm, and I can tell the people at the church to call her. I mean, they get paid to do things like that. I want you to do that. Jesus, I just don't feel comfortable doing that. What are you doing? I am waiting for my cock. <laughs> no, Kat, the problem is the you're too comfortable. Light reading. <laughs> Some lovely calendar choices. <laughs> Would rather glue. <laughs>